you're anything like me, freedom and experience in new cultures is one of the most fulfilling things out there to do. Now, for most of us, we have our jobs, we have our responsibilities, and there's always a lot of kind of barriers in the way to experiencing that. Now, I've been lucky enough to live in many countries around the world. I'm from Ireland originally. I've lived in France and Spain in Brazil and South Africa in the United States, Italy, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina. I've been to many places around the world and I've experienced the digital nomad life as an English teacher. In this video, I want to share my experience with you to give you all the information and tools that you need to set off on this life as a digital nomad, as an English teacher. So how did I manage to travel the world and embrace this life as a digital nomad while teaching English? Well, I'm going to share my story and my journey with you, and I'm going to break it down into five components, shall we say. I'm going to talk about my journey as a digital nomad, the teaching English or TEFL pathways that you can take to become a digital nomad. I'm going to offer you some practical steps to help you get started. We'll talk about some of the challenges and the rewards, and then we'll wrap it up by looking at how you can build that sustainable life as a digital nomad. So let's dive into my journey as a digital nomad. And it all started for me right after I got out of college, or really when I was finishing a college, I had a bunch of friends from different parts of the world, and I really found that I had a love for languages and learning about their cultures and I really had a strong desire in myself to go and visit these places. So, you know, that's one of the first things I guess I would offer to you as advice. Is this something that you love? You know, it's not just going on holidays. You, you really want to get immersed and involved in these cultures and have a love for language and have a love for food and have a love for seeing new places. So really, for me, it all started in my home country of Ireland. I had friends from France and Spain and Brazil and Italy. And I thought, oh, yeah, if I had the chance, I'd love to go to one of those places. And right when I finished college, I headed off to France. And when I arrived in France, I really didn't know what I was going to do and... I just kind of like got there and thought I'd get any random job. And I had a friend at the time who told me about this thing called assistant anglais, which means English assistant. And I had this opportunity to go and work in a lycée, which is a French high school. Now, in those days, I wasn't even qualified. I had no TEFL certification. I had no CELTA, nothing like that. I just had my degree from college and I spoke English as my first language and I got this job. I quickly found that I loved it. I loved working with students. I love putting together materials for classes. And, you know, I kind of dove in at the deep end a little bit. So I was lucky that I found out that I liked it. So, you know, if I could offer advice to younger Fergus or you watching this video, just think about that. Is speaking in front of students something that you think potentially you could like? Now, that doesn't mean if you're not comfortable with public speaking that you shouldn't do it. It is certainly a skill that you can acquire. So if maybe the idea of helping people to learn things and grow, maybe if that side of it appeals to you, but the public speaking part, you know, speaking in front of a class and preparing materials, maybe that doesn't appeal to you. Well, you can learn that and you can improve that. Those are skills that any of us can acquire. So after my experience in France, I came back to Ireland and I was working then in just a, a corporate job that lined up with my degree. I had a degree in law and, you know, that was good. And I thought, OK, this could be the career for me. But I always had this voice in the back of my head calling to me, you know, there's a big world out there and there's a lot of experiences still to be had. So then I had this opportunity to go to Spain and I moved to, first of all, Andalusia in the south of Spain. And then I moved up to Madrid. And my goodness, did I fall in love with that city, Madrid. So wonderful, such culture, wonderful food, wonderful people. And again, I was teaching English. This time I had experience as an English teacher. So I applied to an English academy. Now, I still wasn't qualified. I didn't have a TEFL certificate or a CELTA or a Trinity Cert TESOL, none of that. I just had some experience. And again, I had a degree and I spoke English as my first language. And that was enough to get me in the door. Now, at that time, the school that I worked with 
they offered some teaching orientation. So there was this two days of, you know, where to find materials and how to set up a class. But really, it was very rudimentary. They gave me that and then they sent me off to teach some in-company classes. So I was teaching particularly business people and specifically actually in the Banco de España, the Bank of Spain. So I was teaching people in this um, corporate kind of environment. They had English lessons as part of their job. Now, again, I didn't have a lot of training at the time. As I said, I just had this little orientation course that the school where I worked had given us. So I still was a little bit, I guess, lost. But again, I was loving the experience, working with people, helping them to learn. And I was learning on the job as I went. So I really had now, at this stage, I had two wonderful experiences as an English teacher. And by the time my sojourn in Spain came to an end and I returned to Ireland once more, I thought, okay, I think this could be a career for me. So let's look in Dublin, my native capital city of my native country, Ireland. Let's look for an English language teaching job. This is where I ran into my first roadblock. In Ireland at the time, and still to this day, the teaching English industry, if we can call it that, is regulated. And by that, I mean you must have a certificate to work in an English language school. No English language school would hire me without certification. So I thought, okay, this is something that I want to do. I'm going to invest the time. And I went ahead and took my own TEFL qualification. The qualification that I took at the time was one that's called the CELT or the CELT. It's an Irish equivalent of CELTA or Trinity Cert TESOL. It works very much in the same way. There's four assignments, teaching practice, input sessions, etc. And once I completed that course and had my certificate, when I went to apply for schools, instantly the doors were open for me. I got working right away actually in the school where I did my CELT certificate. And very quickly after that, I found an excellent school in Dublin where I met actually one of my first mentors. Shout out to you, Ian, if you're watching this video. Thank you so much for everything you did with me. And over the next four to five years, I worked in this wonderful school in the north side of uh, Dublin city center. And I fell deeper in love with this profession. I went on then to do my Cambridge Delta certification, which opened yet more doors for me. I got right into teacher training. I became a teacher trainer of that course that I did called the CELT. I was a CELT trainer straight away. But after a few years teaching in Dublin, I was looking for more and the desire to travel again was welling up inside me. So this time I had the opportunity to go to Brazil and I moved to the sprawling metropolis of Sao Paulo, a city of, depending how you look at it, a city of about 30 million people. You know, considering I come from a country, an island of, you know, around 5 million people, I moved to a city that had six times the population of my own country. It was a crazy experience. But yet again, I was blessed. I had a wonderful experience. I got right into learning the language. Now at this stage, I should say, I had already learned French in France. I had learned Spanish in Spain. So by the time I went to Brazil, I was up for learning Portuguese. And you know, my own experience, I found that every new language that I learned was I'd say about half as difficult as the previous one because I guess my mind was set up for catching vocabulary and pieces of functional language and, and grammar. So I very quickly was immersed in the language and the culture. I used to go to diners and cafes and bars and just, I, I didn't care at all about making mistakes or using the perfect grammar or this or that. I would just go, I would just speak and eventually it would, it would stick and you know, I learned a language and learned a culture and learned about food and learned about how to get around the city and learned how to live a life in this wonderful city of Sao Paulo. That's where I spent four years. And, and while I was there, I met another one of my wonderful mentors. Again, shout out Bjarne if you're watching this video. And Bjarne trained me to be a CELTA teacher trainer. And while I was working at that school, I became head of exams. I was the director of studies and I developed a specific focus on teaching not only business English, but 
teaching legal English because my degree actually was in law. So I was able then to leverage all of my background. I didn't have to give up what I had studied or worked in before. Actually, no, I was able to bring that into my profession as an English language teacher and leverage it actually to teach these niche specific classes, which made me more employable and give me yet more experience. And as my experience grew, then I started to teach more, I guess, challenging classes. I started to actually teach teachers who wanted to improve their English. So these would have been Brazilian teachers of English, but they wanted to get to the highest level they could. And I used to teach them what's called the Cambridge proficiency exam. So this is like the highest level, a C2 level that you can get to. I also became an IELTS writing and speaking examiner. And again, this helped to amplify my employability. So by the time I had all of this experience, I really felt, I guess my professional freedom really had grown a lot. There were so many opportunities open up to me around the world. So this brings me on to the second important point, and that's around the pathways to becoming a digital nomad. So I have mentioned, you know, the TEFL certification that I took. Now, I started off, as I mentioned, without any certification. Now, I got lucky because I got some of my initial jobs just by the virtue of the fact that I spoke English and I had a degree and a willingness, I guess, to jump into those kinds of jobs. But if I could offer you advice, it would be to get yourself some certification before you move to another country. Even if you're planning to uh, teach online, having certification helps to give confidence to your students, to your future employers, that you are gonna be a person who can deliver good English lessons. So, of course, you know, you can find out all about it here on my channel. CELTA is one of the big TEFL certificates out there. The Trinity Cert TESOL is another excellent course. And I highly, highly recommend the International TEFL Academies Certificate in TEFL. This is really an excellent option for you if you're looking for something that's a little bit more affordable. And the ITA, International TEFL Academies Service, also has a big focus on helping you find work, which is really something that sets them apart. Not all schools or training centers around the world have this big focus on helping you find work. So really, I highly recommend that International TEFL Academies service when it comes to certification and helping you to find a job. You know, some of the other aspects when you think about the pathway to becoming this digital nomad in the world of teaching English, you gotta think about what's a, a good country for you. So as I mentioned, before I set off and I was finishing college, I had these friends from France and Spain and they really helped to give me an insight into what life is like there, what the language is like, etc. So, you know, I would recommend, you know, do some research. Have you had any exposure or contact with people from any of these countries? Talk to them first if you can. And I don't mean just France or Spain. Whatever country appeals to you. For you, it could be Thailand, it could be Vietnam, it could be Argentina, it could be Canada. Wherever it may be, try to talk to somebody from those places. Now, maybe you don't have somebody who's your neighbor who's from Thailand or whatever, but go online and see if you can find yourself in a Facebook group or some online kind of forum and make connections with people from there and maybe get on a, a Google Meet or a Zoom call with them and talk about what life is like there to help you get a little bit more insight into that initial feeling that you have about a country. So really choose that country that really appeals to you and do your research. And of course, the other big part to this pathway to becoming a digital nomad is to think about the type of teaching job. Not all teaching jobs are the same. So as I mentioned, I taught general English, but I also taught these niche or specific areas of English. That's sometimes called ESP, English for Specific Purposes. So I ended up teaching a lot of legal English again. I had a background in that, so that helped me get into that area. But there are other areas that you can jump into. For example, teaching exam classes, that's a really big one. Some of the big exams out there, probably the biggest one in the world is IELTS, the International English Language Testing System. So many countries put a lot of emphasis on that exam. There is, of course, the Cambridge suite of exams. So you have your CAT, your PET, your FCE, 
your Cambridge Advanced and your Cambridge Proficiency course. These could be areas that you could carve out a niche for yourself. Or if you have a background in anything, I know some people who were nurses before, so they ended up teaching uh, medical English. There is English for aviation purposes. A really big area, of course, is business English. A lot of people, uh, for example, in my contacts in Spain and Brazil, I have so many students from banks and various other types of businesses who realized that English was going to be important for their own career development. And by me having a specialization in teaching those classes, I became more employable. Now, how can you get yourself up to speed to teach exam classes or teaching any kind of ESP, English for specific purposes like business English? Well, you can just get yourself a business English book, for example, look it over, prepare a lesson, and you're going to realize actually that the frameworks for teaching general English can actually be applied to these niche areas. So you just need to make sure that you've done some research so that you know kind of like the context, the topic area, and then you're going to just use your teaching skills. So you're going to end up teaching grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, reading, writing, speaking, listening, all of these things that you would teach normally in a general English class, you're going to do those in these niche areas, but you've just done some research on the topics at hand so that you can provide that context and activate schemata in the student. In some countries, there's a greater focus on private tutoring or, for example, in some Asian countries like South Korea, there's a really big focus on teaching young learners. There's a lot of jobs in kind of kindergarten schools. So maybe that could be something that appeals to you. Whereas those kinds of jobs are less common in a country that speaks English already, like where I live at the moment, Canada, you're probably not going to get a job as an English language teacher in a kindergarten, but you might get a job as an English language teacher in an immigration service. I actually worked in the immigration services of Nova Scotia, the province where I live in Canada, and there was a lot of work in those kinds of contexts. So look into the type of teaching job. Is it in person or is it online? Decide what appeals to you the most. Maybe you want a blend of that, especially as a digital nomad. Having some sort of online presence is certainly something that is going to be big for you as a digital nomad because it provides you a lot of freedom of movement. By the way, if you're really serious about becoming an English language teacher or getting into this lifestyle as a digital nomad, well, there's a link down in the description or there's this QR code that you can scan with your phone and you can use that to set up a free 45 minute call where we can talk together, you and me, about those objectives and maybe set out a pathway for you to achieve those goals. So please go ahead, click that link. It's absolutely free and we can talk one-on-one about your goals and how you can achieve them. Okay, back to the video. So the next point I wanna talk about are the practical steps in getting started as an English teacher and living the life of a digital nomad. So I've talked about certification already, and I've kind of talked about finding a job. If we get into the details of finding a job, what do you have to do? You've got to get your CV just right. So spend some time at your CV, and you don't want to just send out the same CV to all the employers. You're going to have a much better chance of finding employment if you tailor your CV to each job that you're applying to. Now, you've got to get ready. You could send out 50, maybe even 100 CVs get five replies and just one job. You have to be ready for that. Try not to be discouraged by sending out so many CVs and getting so few responses. It's just the nature of looking for a job. Spend some time researching the employer that you are applying for as well. There's always going to be reviews out there online about working for various employers. So I would highly recommend checking that out, doing some Google searches. What's it like to work for such and such an employer? What's it like to work in such and such a country? These kind of research topics are gonna help you a lot. So once you've got that CV ready, tailored, found the employers that are interesting for you, you gotta look into the legalities of working in the country that you've chosen. So a big thing is visas. So again, I've talked about this before on this channel, you know, I am from Ireland, which is part of the European Union. So for me to travel in Spain or France or 
any of those countries. There was no visa restrictions for me by virtue of the fact that I have a European Union passport. However, if you're from outside of the European Union, you're going to have to look into what are the work permit or visa situations for a person from your country. Now, it could be different for people from different countries. So I can't just say anywhere in the world, you have to go through this and that steps. Again, do your research beforehand. You don't want to show up to a country and find out that you only have the right to be a tourist and that you can't work at all. Most countries will let you in for a three month visa as a tourist, but you're not allowed to work at all. So check that out beforehand, see what the process is like to get that visa so that you can work in your country of destination. This is crucial. I would hate to hear of anybody making this big change in their life and then finding out that they can't even work. That would be a very sad situation. So make sure that you check that out beforehand. Okay, so you've figured out the country, you've got your CV together, you've seen what you need to do when it comes to visas, etc. So the next thing you really want to think about are what are the rewards and what are some of the challenges of this life as an English teacher stroke digital nomad? Well, for me, some of the biggest benefits, I kind of mentioned them already, is this cultural enrichment. You know, even just speaking another language, I for me, I, I find it really joyful. Like, of course, I make all sorts of errors when I speak Spanish or French or Portuguese or whatever language it is. But actually, I find that a lovely way to make friends because people will kind of laugh at me and say, oh, that was a silly way or a funny way that you said that. That's not how we say it in our language. And this is how you say it. So, you know, the friends you make by kind of like letting down your guard, letting down your barriers, not afraid to make some mistakes, not afraid to have a little laugh at yourself actually, or have somebody laugh with you about the silly thing that you said. I remember one time in Brazil, I, I translated a phrase that isn't even general in English. And in, in my country, in, in Ireland, we can say to put the cat amongst the pigeons. And that kind of means to like say something like kind of controversial or to you know cause a little bit of chaos or mayhem and i remember translating that as best i could into portuguese i remember saying eu vou uh, jogar o gato dentro dos palomas and palomas is not even the word for uh, pigeons it's uh, yeah i i was i think using a spanish word in Portuguese, and I remember everybody just looking at me like, what the hell are you saying? And some people were laughing at me. And then I tried to explain to everybody what I was saying. And they were like, no, we do not say that at all. Okay, I get the idea of what you're saying. We had a great laugh about it. And then, you know, people helped me with what I was actually uh, trying to say. And then I remember learning some like really beautiful uh, idioms. I remember in, in Portuguese learning the idiom, which is abreu mau. Uh, and that one means abrir is like open and umau is your hand. So it's open your hand. And that kind of means like let go of the things that you're clinging on to so you can have a bit more freedom in life. Maybe it's quite apt for our thoughts of being a digital nomad, having that freedom in our lives. So I guess this one is kind of a challenge, but it was also a huge reward for me. As I said, I found it so joyful. And then, you know, my own linguistic abilities grew and I, I just find this a, a wonderful experience. Obviously things like, you know, the weather, the scenery, the geography, I got to see some unbelievable places in my life. Oh my goodness. I remember going to a place again in Brazil called Ilha Grande, which just actually translates as big island. It's kind of off the coast of the state of Rio de Janeiro. It was an unforgettably beautiful. I, I don't even have the words to describe how beautiful it was. You know, people often ask me, what was the best country you've been to? Or what's the most beautiful? And you know, it might sound like a kind of middle of the road answer, but honestly, it's true. There's no one place that's the most beautiful. I could talk about Ilha Grange, but then I could talk about New Grange in my own country of Ireland. And those places are so different. Or here in Nova Scotia, there's a wonderful place called Cape Breton Island, and that's unspeakably beautiful as well. Each place has its own distinct beauty, and that's the richness of our lives and this wonderful world that we get to live in. So experiencing more and more of that, you know, I, I may not have huge amounts of money in the bank account, but I'm a very rich person when it comes to the experiences that I've been lucky enough to have, both in terms of scenery 
and people that I've met along the way. Oh my goodness, that's just been so wonderful. It gives me such hope, you know, and I meet so much of humanity. That's just been such a wonderful experience to meet wonderful people from all around the world. You know, we all live in this information age where the internet is telling us all these kind of terrible things that are going on in the world. But then when you meet actual people on the ground and you realize, hey, we're not so different. We're actually, you know, more more similar than we are different. And in the end, we like to just laugh and share stories. And that's been one of the highlights for me as a digital nomad, this human connection. You know, more rewards are things like there's a kind of financial independence aspect to it too. You know, you might find that your job in the country where you're living doesn't really allow you to have the kind of lifestyle that you're looking for. You could move to a country that has a lower cost of living and maybe you could maintain your employment by being a digital nomad. All you need is your laptop and you know some wherewithal when it comes to technology and you can try and maintain the same kind of salary but in a country that has a lower cost of living, that is going to give you a lot more financial independence. Might even allow you to save money for some of your bigger goals in life. Now, of course, this lifestyle does come with its challenges too. You know, if you do this alone, there's often this period, I've experienced it basically every country I've gone to in the first month to three months, you might have a kind of like sense of regret. Why have I done this? What am I doing here? I don't have any of my friends around. I can't connect. I can't speak the language. Everything's strange to me. I promise that that is temporary. Now, it's difficult. It's really difficult. A feeling of loneliness, a feeling of isolation. You know, I, I've been there. I, I know what it is. And I'll, I'll tell you this. It was so hard for me, actually, in one of the countries I love the most, Brazil. It was so hard for me that I actually left Brazil after a few months when I was there the first time. It was it was too difficult for me to adjust. It was too big of a difference. And I left and I went home to Ireland. But I still had this niggling feeling in me that like, no, I shouldn't have given up there. It was just actually starting to get good by the time I left. I was actually starting to make friends. I started to know some parts of the city. And... That feeling welled up inside me again. I decided to go back and thank God I did because you know I ended up spending four more years there in Brazil and it's, you know, there's a word in Portuguese which is saudades and saudades is this kind of like feeling of, you know, Brazilians like to say there's no translation for this word saudades and I, you know, I, I, I kind of agree in a way because you, you only kind of like know that feeling once you've been in Brazil and then you, you, you leave it. But it's this feeling of, I guess longing and uh, you, you kind of like uh, it's kind of it, it, it has a kind of like nostalgic or uh, almost melancholic kind of aspect to it that you really miss this place and I was feeling this saudade when I went back to Ireland I was feeling the saudade for for Brazil you know Brazilians would say to matar os saudades which is like to kill your saudades and so I went back to Brazil to matar os meus saudades to kill my saudades to to put them to rest and and to go back and then I had this incredibly uh, joyful life. So, you know, that, that, that story is just to, you know, let you know that, hey, I had traveled all over the world at this stage and still I found this kind of lonely feeling coming coming in there and like, but but it's temporary. You will meet good people who'll help you and you'll start to make friends and you'll start to find things that you enjoy and all of a sudden you love it and all of a sudden it's become a life-changing experience for you. I have talked as well about language. You know, again, I loved it. I love learning French, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, but again, it's a barrier. That was part of the reason why I left Brazil in the beginning. Even though I spoke Spanish, which has a lot of similarities to Portuguese, and actually it helped me. I could like read the newspaper on the first day, but I couldn't understand Brazilians, especially if I go to a party and three or four Brazilians were speaking together. Of course, everybody would be really nice and try and include me, but you know, I, I get lost in conversations and just, you know, wouldn't wouldn't really be able to participate. And it, 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 it felt kind of like I was inhibited or it was felt like I was, oh, I really want, like I can see these are lovely people and I really wish that I could participate as, as much as they, they can. So language is a barrier, but again, it gets better. For me, after a few months living in Brazil, I was able to participate uh, a lot more. And, you know, especially after a few years living there, I actually often tell the story by the end, 
you know, I would go six months and almost speak no English. I was dreaming in Portuguese at that stage, you know, and that's a, that's a wonderful experience to wake up and say, my whole dream was in another language. It's, it's a, it's a really, I highly recommend that experience. It's, it's very cool. So I just want to give one more shout out to the link in the description below. If any of this is resonating with you and if any of this part of this digital nomad, Tefl, Salta life is resonating with you, why not go ahead and click the link? You got nothing to lose. It's just going to be a short call where, or a long call, usually around 45 minutes, where I'll talk to you about your objectives and how I could help you achieve them because that's really my mission with this whole YouTube channel and my service as a consultant i really want to draw on this not just by experience but i do have expertise and qualifications in these areas too and i've decided to bring all of that together to help you out there in the world achieve those goals so please do you know you can scan this qr code or head on down to the description just below this video click on that link it takes two seconds to set up a call and i'll be really happy to talk to you about those goals so the last thing that I want to talk to you about is building that sustainable life as a digital nomad. One of the big things that I talk about in my consultations to help people to achieve this is budgeting and finances. Personally, in my younger years, it wasn't something I give a lot of talk to. And, you know, I did struggle at times because of that. I wasn't really very good at budgeting. I would just kind of like fly by the seat of my pants. And sometimes, you know, I was couldn't do some of the things that I wanted to do and I might have been able to achieve them if I had just put a budget in place. Having a little bit of discipline to save up, to set yourself a goal, that can be extremely powerful. It's ex very simple, but extremely powerful. I always like to use the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. That's often a good way to approach finances. However, I really get into the nitty gritty of that in uh, some career guidance sessions when it comes to my consultation so if you're interested in that you can you know talk to me about it but you know if you're a person who is thinking about finances do some research out there maybe start just a very simple budget you don't even have to know how to use microsoft excel or google sheets just do one on a piece of paper look at how much money is coming in look at how much is going out see where you can cut back so that you can save to match up with a future goal. And you always want to think about expanding your skills. Make yourself more employable, as employable as you possibly can. So get into areas like teaching exam classes, teaching English for specific purposes, teaching exam classes. These are areas that's going to open more doors to you and make you more employable so that you can get out there in the world and experience this incredible life as an English teacher and digital nomad. Okay, that's it for this video. Please do let me know down in the comments. First of all, where are you in the world? Where are you watching this video from? I always ask people that in the comments because I, I love it. It's, it's kind of a virtual way for me to continue my own digital nomadism. And which countries are you thinking about going to? And what area of teaching are you looking to get into? Are you looking to do face-to-face, -face, online, teaching kids, teaching business people, general English, teaching exam classes, English for specific purposes? Let me know what you have your eye on. And have you taken any TEFL certification? Are you doing a TEFL course like the International TEFL Academies course? Are you going to do something like CELTA? Or are you going to do Trinity? Or are you going to do the Irish Celt? What course are you looking at doing? Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please do give it a thumbs up. Hit that bell icon. It just tells YouTube, hey, people like this video and share it with more people. That's a big part of my mission to get this word out there so that more and more people can benefit from it. I'd love as well if you could share it on your social media or anything that makes sense to you. That'll really help a lot. Okay, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one and bye for now.